Thank you. We are October 6th. This is um, call to order for our Accessibility Advisory Committee. It is 7.15. Can I have a roll call, please? Committee member Linda Buttle. Here. Committee member Franz Gilman. Committee member Dave Burgosh. Here. And Chair Lynn Grinstead. I am here. I would like to to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we work and gather is the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe people. This Algonquin nation have lived on this land for thousands of years, long before the arrival of the European settlers, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to present in this territory. I need an adoption of the agenda, please. Be a result of the agenda for the Armpair Accessibility Advisory Committee meeting dated Wednesday, December 1st, 2021, be adopted. I move so, that to be adopted, Dave. Thank you, Dave. And Linda, second. Um, do, do either of you have any questions or comments before we move on? No. Favor? Aye. Right. Any disclosures of pecuniary interest? I can't no. see none. We need an adoption of the previous minutes. That the Armbar Accessibility Advisory Committee approve the minutes listed under item number 6A on the agenda. Mover and a seconder. I'll move, Dave. Thank you. Linda, second? Yes. Um, do we have any um, comments on the, on the minutes? Seeing none, so all in favor? Aye. Good. So we have three presentations. We're gonna start with the downtown patio pilot. I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, so um, in this summer, the town uh, implemented a pilot project, which saw uh, three of our restaurants downtown set up um, temporary patios within the actual parking stalls. Um, there was two on John Street and one on Elgin Street. Um, so the patios used um, two parking spaces each and uh, the town provided barricades uh, around the outside to protect um, the diners as well as uh, drivers also. Um, and this additional space allowed the restaurants to utilize the current patios they had right against their building as well as these additional ones. Um, in hopes to help them recover from some of the negative impacts of COVID-19 um, and because they were restricted to outside dining only for a large majority of uh, this year. So now that we, we've had these patios for, for the rest of the season, um, the town's collecting some feedback on this pilot project to consider whether we should amend our sidewalk patio license bylaw to allow for these extended patios in future years as well. Um, it, hopefully we won't be dealing with COVID restrictions next summer, but um, the thought would be to amend it on a permanent basis going forward. Um, so we have actually had a, a feedback survey that's been out to the general public. It closed today. We had 276 responses from that survey. Um, and it asked the public what type of patio option they preferred, what they thought of the actual extended patios that we had this year. Um, I've also interviewed the three businesses that participated in the program to see how they found the program, if they found it worthwhile, if it's something they would like to see in the future, and any ideas they had um, to improve the program as well. Um, and specifically, I, I'm coming to the committee to gather uh, feedback from an accessibility standpoint, specifically, as well as any other feedback you have on the pilot project um, and the different options that are available. The one that we went with this year, um, because it, it, had, it maintained a straight path of travel, it was also the quickest one that we could get set up. And it was something that the town could fund versus relying on the businesses to put out money when they were already um, experiencing negative effects from COVID. Uh, so it was the quickest one we could get set up, um, as well as uh, one that didn't cost the restaurants any money. We did waive any fees for patios this year. So um, there wasn't any cost to the businesses this year, but that could be something that would be different in future years. So I just have a couple of um, patio types that I wanted to go through. And then um, I, I'm happy to go back 
and I have pictures up, but I'll also describe the different patio options and I'd love your feedback on the different options. Um, so patio type number one is what we actually had implemented this summer where you have a small patio along the, the facade of the building itself, as well as the patio set up in the parking stall itself. And this means that the pedestrians and the people walking on the sidewalk actually walk in between the two patios, but it maintains a straight path of travel for um, those using the sidewalk. They don't need to navigate around any patio. Um, the servers didn't find any, any issues with traffic. They were able to see both directions and see if anyone was coming before they crossed. Um, and it allowed the pedestrians to stay walking on the sidewalk it did, however, utilize two parking spaces um, per restaurant in our downtown. The next option that we looked at was um, a similar, similar option, except no parking stalls were utilized. It would just add for a couple additional, uh, it would allow for the patio to actually be placed along the roadside instead of along the restaurant side. So patrons would be sitting closest to the road and those walking along the sidewalk would be walking closest to the building. Once again, this would maintain a straight path of travel for anyone walking on the sidewalk. Um, and it wouldn't utilize any parking spaces at all in our downtown. Um, the third type that we looked at is something that has been seen in other municipalities. Um, and this is where the patio itself actually takes up the entire sidewalk um, and pedestrians are um, bypassed around the patio. Uh, into the parking stalls, um, but there's uh, typically out of wood built a facility, um, uh, like a patio structure that's built in the parking stalls so that there's um, no dip at the curb. It's a smooth, flat uh, travel. It's typically about a 45 angle degree angle for pedestrians to bypass around. Um, and depending on where the restaurant is set up and how it lines up with parking stalls, this option takes up two or three parking stalls per patio, um, depending on where the lines line up. Um, but because they need that 45 degree angle on either end, they end up taking about additional parking spaces up um, beyond the two that the other option we did. So this wouldn't be a straight path of travel. It would require pedestrians to walk around the patio, um, but it would keep the patio all in one big section um, utilizing this, the full width of the sidewalk. And then the fourth type is what we've had in previous years where restaurants just have the patio that is against their building um, and they don't have an extended one. It doesn't use any parking stalls at all. Um, we still maintain that 1.5 meter straight path of travel on the sidewalk um, in between the tree grates and the patio furniture that's installed there. Um, and, and this is what we've had in previous years, uh, but it obviously doesn't allow for an extension of the patios. It just allows them to have a patio on the sidewalk um, and accommodate as many people as they can, depending on how wide their facade of the building is. And then obviously there's always the option to not allow patios at all on our sidewalk or our parking stalls, um, which is, is also an option and something we did ask in um, this the survey whether we should be allowing patios at all. So I was just looking to get any feedback or comments on if if you got to experience the patios this summer, if you walked down down, any feedback you had, if you if you've experienced different types of patios um, in other communities, if there's ever been any issues navigating the ones that require a bypass, or if you had any issues. Um, navigating any of the patio options that were presented or anything that you could foresee being an issue with any of those options. Okay. What were the three restaurants that? Um, so Lumbertown Ale House, uh, the Urban Steak and Sweet and Sassy were the three that participated this year. Oh. Lindsay, can I get you to just on share your screen so I can see everybody? Oh, yeah. yeah, please, thank you. Sorry. Thank you, thank you. David, did you have something else to offer? Um, yeah, why was there only three taking part? We had offered it to um, all of the restaurants that are in the downtown area. Um, and those were the only three that wanted to participate this year. The biggest mm -hmm. um, 
issue was they didn't have staffing to staff any like there there is a big staffing shortage um so yeah. they're finding challenges staffing their current patios and their inside dining and they didn't think they could accommodate larger um patio mm. yeah so I, I would imagine if they had the staff they love to have patio space yes mm-hmm. okay go ahead linda First of all, I think it's a wonderful thing to have. And second of all, and my question is on uh, the, the third patio type, the one that has the extensive um, walk away, that I presume is removable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it would be removable. Um, and in that option too, I forgot to mention, um, the business themselves would be responsible for building that structure. Um, so the price of lumber will be a little cheaper but that's one of the reasons we didn't go with that option this year is because um it be quite expensive initially to build that structure for the businesses yeah. but yes it would be fully removable we require all of our patios to be removed um november 1st to allow for any snow okay. in place mm-hmm. well i thought it was lovely great okay i have a couple of questions comments the survey is up until when for people to answer? It closed today. Oh, so open for the past three weeks. Were we given notice of that? Yep. Take part? Okay, I don't remember seeing that. Where, sorry, where? I never saw anything. I mean, I did, I did, but I thought it was be, because I was part of this. Yeah, it was um, sent out to the committee members by okay. email. It's also been available on. Um, our website, we had a newspaper art, uh, newspaper ad for it, uh, as well as we've been sharing it. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to read the newspaper a little more carefully. Yeah, yeah me too, because remember I said how busy I am, so I guess I missed yeah. that somehow. Um, but, uh, that's why I'm coming here for your feedback uh, to yeah. as well. So just uh, when they came the first time, obviously I was very much in favor of type three, and I still am. Um, because I just think it's it's more cohesive for the restaurant to have everything in one spot and not crossing over traffic and everything. Yes, I understand that nobody had an issue this year, but if next year we had maybe five restaurants doing it as opposed to three or whatnot, um, maybe there would be a little more. And plus, um, I'm thinking too, once COVID does ease up a little bit too, maybe there would be more foot traffic and whatnot. Um, why couldn't we do this with the concrete barriers and as opposed to making them do the wood, why couldn't we do the concrete barriers and then have some kind of removable little lip, like a ramp for accessibility? Um, for every uh, inch you go up, you have to go out a foot to meet the building code. So um, you wouldn't have the width of the parking stall to, to meet the height of the curb with a, a ramp. Okay, that's unfortunate. Um, and then the other question I had is, why does there have to be that 45 degree angle? Why couldn't we uh, make it a straight across like we did with the with the concrete barriers and just make sure that their um, patio is within that space? Like, do you know what I mean? Leaving this, whatever, a three foot entrance on either end to get to that walkway and, and, and keep them within the parking spaces. Um, you know what I'm just trying 40, to say? I, I can draw yeah. it, but I, I'm trying to explain it. The 45 degree angle just helps with um, the like turning radius. So if you're pushing a stroller or if you're in a wheelchair, it just makes it easier than trying to navigate a 90 degree turn um, in such a small space. For sure. Okay, okay. I knew there was reasons. So I was just trying to figure out what they were. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, personally, I still think that type three is the most attractive looking um, and and the best for flow as far as I'm concerned. So that would be still my my preference in the whole thing. But it was it's great to see that uh, that at least three of them were able to take part in that this year. <laughs> so your feedback that you got, Lindsay, from those three, would they want to do it again? 
Um, depending on what type of patio they were allowed to do and uh, what the cost to them would be. Um, yes. Cool. Any other questions, Lindsay? Thank you, Bye. Just um, like part of the things we looked at was maintaining a straight path of travel versus having turns. Is, is there any concern with like, is maintaining a straight path of travel preferred or um, does it really not matter? Oh, I think it's preferred. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say it's preferred. I mean, it, what happens if you have say eight of these restaurants and the sidewalk is blocked off um, when you're walking, if you, if you had to go around, say four of these restaurants, it's, uh, it's not ideal for wheelchairs or guide dogs, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Great, no extras. I didn't wanna make any assumptions, but I assumed it, like you're, you're right, that we just, we would have one bypass this year, but there are quite a number of restaurants that are either beside each other or um, there's a, a, rush, a, a storefront in between them and you don't want to be navigating around three or four along one similar stretch of sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but also too, if, if, let's just say hypothetically, every single restaurant downtown wanted to partake in this. Mm -hmm. So basically, because I'm just thinking um, the Uptown uh, Resto, then you have Lumbertown, and then you have um, the cupboard the on the farm. end. So the there's urban some, Farm Girls. And Urban Farm Girls. So there's four on that side. So one the Vietnamese subs place. <gasps> The Vietnamese, but they don't have an eat in section anyways. They're mostly not a takeout. Currently. Right. They're not currently during COVID. But pretty basically, okay, so let's just hypothetically say all of them wanted it. You're pretty much taking up that whole the whole row of parking. Yeah. So the biggest concern coming through from the public survey is they don't want to lose any parking downtown. So um, from other municipalities I had looked at initially. Um, some of the options, I believe it was Carlton Place that did a, a lottery system. So they said, we're willing to give up six or eight parking spots downtown. And anyone that was interested would submit and that would be done on a lottery basis. I think that if the uptake was um, greater, even like from three to six, I think that I think that we have to and maybe that's not this committee, maybe that's council, but I think we have to really look look at that because that I think would be troublesome to, to give up uh, a whole lot of them. Yeah, that would be something that would come forward if we were making this amendment uh, for council to consider whether they wanted to put a limit on yeah. a deadline for submissions and then do a lottery system or if they're willing to losing more than six parking slots. Yeah, I mean, we do have the parking lots, but still there are days that those are so so well used that, uh, yeah. So that's definitely something to think about. Any other comments? I, I would think that restaurants, if they had the staff, uh, that these patios would be a revenue generator. So uh, I would think almost all of them would want that if it's going to make them money. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Depending on um, what the cost to them would be, if they were, if they were required to build um, the bypass structure that might deter some of them, depending on um, what sort of their break even point would be. But I think a large majority of them would be interested. Mm -hmm. So do we have a time frame on the patio permit? Like, so, I'm just thinking, um, for instance, the new restaurant that's going in, they'll have weekend um, music and whatnot. So they'll be open a little bit later. Do we have time, like time constraints on when they can use the outdoor patios? Um, our patio policy does have a, um, a time in it. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I believe it aligns with our noise bylaw. Right. Hmm. Okay. All right. Anything else, guys? Okay, thank you, Lindsay. 
Next up is Graham with the Nick Smith um, parking lot paving project update. Graham, your mic is off, my dear. Yeah, just gonna share my screen here, find the right one. Can everyone see it now? Yep. Yep. Um, okay. Sorry, my computer was spooling there for a moment. <laughs> All right. So um, I I believe I presented back in the spring to the Accessibility Advisory Committee an update about what was going to be transpiring with our, our parking lot paving project. So now that we've kind of reached that completion point of this uh, this project, I wanted to give uh, the committee an update on, on what's taking place here at the Nick Smith Center. So H&H um, &H Construction were awarded the Nick Smith Center parking lot paving contract in the spring of 2021. Uh, this, the project start date uh, was supposed to begin in June. Um, we were uh, very fortunate just with the layout of our facility that we were able to um, host the, the the vaccination clinics here, uh, utilizing a drive-through model that uh, that proved very successful. Not just uh, you know here in our prior and throughout Renfrew County, but something that I know a lot of uh, municipalities and health units across the province uh, aim to mirror as well because of the success that was here. So um, as a result of that, the the project was delayed um, and did not commence uh, in full until August of of 2021. Um, and the paving project was completed um, in the month of October. And so this project has helped our recreation hub being the next Smith Center to be more accessible for everyone. Uh, so the parking lot paving project provided uh, or provides the following accessible upgrades to this facility. So there are now a, a total of 12 accessible parking stalls um, with the following breakdown uh, of these locations. So there's nine stalls now at the, at the front entrance. Previously, there were six. There are two stalls at the side entrance to Burt Hall Arena, which is our uh, Arena A. There were none previously. And there is one stall at the side entrance to the Glen Arthur Arena, which is Arena B. There was none in that location either. And of course, both of those areas uh, of both arenas uh, as you may recall, was just gravel parking lot. So very difficult to have designated accessible uh, stalls in those locations. Uh, so there is now a total of 234 uh, marked parking stalls here at the, the Nick Smith Center uh, and 12 of those 234 are accessible. We also have curbed or grade level entry to all points of entry and emergency exits uh, to our facility. Um, so outside of the main entrance to the Nick Smith Center, that was uh, really the only true uh, accessible point of, of uh, entry and exit in this facility. Uh, Burt Hall, or sorry, yeah, Burt Hall Arena, the side entry to, to Arena A, uh, does have a curbed entry. So you'll see a, a sloped ramp that provides um, accessible access through that door. Um, and then all other points of entry and exit, all of our emergency exits are now um, at grade level. Um, so there's no lip to, to, to exit the, the facility or to enter if you were to enter through any of those uh, emergency exit doors for whatever reason. The sidewalks that connect James Street uh, through to the Nick Smith Center parking lot to the front entrance uh, of the Nick Smith Center. Um, so previously the parking lot ended uh, pretty much at the, I'll say the laneway from James Street into the Nick Smith Center. Now that parking lot follows the route all the way through the laneway. Um, and then there are a, a series of, I'll, I'll call them two islands 
um, as the sidewalk kind of uh, wraps around through the front entrance of the Nick Smith Center. There are twizzies at uh, all sidewalk curbs, um, and then that would carry you right through to the front of the Nick Smith Center. And there's also uh, a pretty lengthy run of, of twizzies across the, the main entrance as well. So I have just a series of, uh, of images uh, just to kind of uh, highlight some of the, the improvements that this project has uh, resulted in here. So this, uh, this image is at the, the main entrance to the Nick Smith Center. So you can see uh, in this picture, just five of the, the nine accessible parking stalls that are, that are now there. There is signage uh, designating these on the fence as well as uh, painting, painted markings on the asphalt itself. And this is just an aerial view from, from the roof. So you can see those, those nine accessible uh, stalls that are directly in front of the main entrance of the Nick Smith Center. Um, and they're kind of uh, all captured inside of a pair of, uh, of speed humps that we also had installed previously, um, but have been reinstated through this project. And that's just a traffic calming measure uh, at, a, at a very high traffic area of the facility. Um, but certainly does not impede anybody with uh, accessibility needs to, to, to go to and from um, the Nick Smith Center. Uh, so this is a, a, an image of the front entrance. So you can see the, the twizzies that run the full length of, of that front entryway. And these two images, the one on the left uh, highlights the two accessible stalls for the Bird Hall Arena, Arena A, and on the right-hand side, the accessible stalls on uh, Glen Arthur Arena B. You'll note that currently there's only um, just the accessible painted markings on the asphalt. There will be signs put up on the building. There's just been a delay in the, uh, in the arrival of those signs. Uh, this is just an image from uh, the rooftop of the Nick Smith Center, just to show uh, the entire uh, main parking lot uh, fully uh, asphalted, uh, lines are painted there. And while there aren't um, any accessible stalls in this, in this main area, it just does highlight the fact that, you know, the whole parking lot now is paved and that just makes it easier for, many, for anyone who, who might have any type of accessible or mobility issue. Um, it just makes it a lot more easier to, to navigate, especially in the winter months when we know what that parking lot turns into. Um, with the divots and slip hazards and, and everything else, right? So um, this is certainly a, a major upgrade to, to our facility and we're, uh, we're, we're very happy that these changes were made and grateful to, uh, to council for, for approving this project. Uh, so this is just uh, an image that highlights the sidewalk that comes in off of Jane Street through kind of the laneway into the Nick Smith Center. And just another image of the sidewalk as it kind of curves towards the first set of islands. Um, and again, you can see the twizzies at the, at the curb edge. Um, and on the right hand side of this image here, you can see those two islands, um, again, that connect to the front, uh, the sidewalk that comes across the front entry to the Nick Smith Center. So just a couple of next steps here. So updating the parking information on the Town of Arm Prior website, just highlighting uh, the, the, the number of accessible parking stalls that we have here and their location. Um, bylaw enforcement has, has certainly, I think, always been a challenge here at, at the Nick Smith Center, just because you've never had designated uh, line painting. You can't, it's not very easy to do on gravel. Now that the whole parking lot is paved and the adequate signage is now posted, it's certainly going to make uh, bylaw enforcement that much easier here at the facility. Uh, looking at grant opportunities for further accessible upgrades as we always do. So kind of next on that list would be looking at uh, more accessible door operators uh, for those side arena entrances as an example, um, which I might add have been a huge uh, benefit to us as a multi-use facility um, throughout uh, uh, kind of the, the, the pandemic because we've been able to use those as um, specific points of entry and exit. So we're not having that, uh, that load issue in the main lobby of the facility. Everyone's kind of been using the different points of entry and exit to use each arena, the pool through the front entrance and the community hall through its respective entry as well. And then also updating wayfinding signage 
um, through the ongoing inclusive communities grant that we received in the new year. And I presented on that back in, in the spring as well. So uh, that project is due to be completed at the end of March of, of 2022. So right now uh, we're in the process of completing the RFP to get out there for the signage design um, uh, development and installation here at the Nick Smith Center. And happy to, uh, to take any questions at this time. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Sure. The twizzy is something I, it's a fur, uh, term I'm not familiar with, but I'll tell you what, it makes a huge difference for somebody who has um, disability, um, mobility disability. It is absolutely wonderful to have that sense of um, safety coming off the the, the, the curb or the, the not curb, you know, mm -hmm. it's, a, it, it's wonderful. Great, thank you. Yeah, I was it, just it there is... tonight and I, I noticed it yet again, it's great. Great. And we've also yeah. heard actually uh, a lot of feedback from uh, from parents, especially uh, like the mums that come here for the, the mums and tot skates or, or swims. Um, just even using that stroller, especially when they might have another toddler in, in tow. And it just kind of gives you that that gentle reminder uh, on the wheels as you're approaching the curb or just kind of slows things down. Yeah. So it's it certainly yeah. uh, has a lot of benefits. Yeah, Graham, I have the same question. I wasn't familiar with the term uh... <laughs> A twizzy, but is that the grips on the cement? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the ones on the on the sidewalk are are all um, are all metal, um, much like the downtown. Um, and you'll notice that um, you know they they do kind of have that uh, that rusty look uh, over time. The ones across the front of the building are uh, are a, a firmer plastic, um, so they and they're a, a very vibrant yellow color. So, um, I mean, there's no concern with them. We just have to be mindful when we're doing any of our snow clearing, we can't use the plows uh, on those because that will um, wreck them. But we typically shovel that area anyway, so. Mm. Oh, great. Any other comments or questions for Graham? It looks great. Thank you, Graham. So up next, uh, the waterfront master plan. Yeah, just let me. Share my screen again here. All right, so just uh, a bit of a background on the, the waterfront master plan, uh, the, the, the draft of which was, was first tabled to, uh, to council at uh, last week's uh, meeting of council. So in 2019, the town uh, retained Think Design to undertake the waterfront master plan with the goal to complete the plan in 2020 uh, per the 2020, 2023 strategic plan goals. With the impacts of COVID-19, uh, the final product was delayed. However, um, staff are, are pleased to recommend the waterfront master plan uh, at this time. So it's important to, to keep in mind the, the seven key directions that were determined as part of the issues and options analysis that was completed back in, in 2017 um, that have been used to help guide the direction of the Waterfront Master Plan. So those, uh, those seven key directions were as follows, to improve access and increase connectivity, enhance the visitor experience, provide spaces to celebrate and enjoy, support arts, culture, and heritage, improve the aesthetic of the waterfront, provide multi-season benefit, and be ecologically driven. Sorry, I just wanna make sure that I'm, ah, oh, there we are, I'm on the right presentation here. So uh, the site reviews uh, began in, ran through December, 2019 and March, 2020 by Think Design. Uh, we held a public open house, uh, which was our, first and only open house in March of 2020. Uh, and that, that open house was held uh, a week before uh, COVID-19 uh, kind of put us in, um, in the state of affairs that uh, we've kind of been in for the last 18 months. Uh, so through that time, we also completed stakeholder interviews during March of 2020. And then again, in the fall and winter of 2020 and 2021, and those were done in a virtual format. 
So obviously the process was delayed due to uh, COVID-19. So we did have a lot of remote engagement um, in early 2021, uh, which included our online feedback that was received through armpriorwaterfront.ca, uh, uh, this program called Bang the Table, and that allowed the public to engage online, make comments to the design, uh, participate in an online survey, uh, to, to kind of garner their feedback on what they felt was the priority and what elements of the various plans for the different park spaces and waterfront spaces, I should say, uh, that they preferred over the other. So the proposed plan offers a total of 65 recommendations to allow the town to realize a waterfront design which achieves these directions and recognizes the asset the town has in its waterfront. So while addressing the appropriate timing and expenditures required to provide these enhancements to meet uh, the vision proposed, the completion of the plan sets the stage for improvements to be made in an orderly manner, setting out a plan to realize the improvements with the opportunity to look at funding opportunities, take advantage of grants and partnerships as they arise and include projects within our long range capital forecast. So a total cost of approximately $8.5 million was planned out over a 20 year horizon. The plan allows for improvements to all major waterfront areas along with achieving cohesive connectivity between each of them. Furthermore, the plan recognizes the value of the marina as a separate but important asset to our waterfront and outlines studies that would be required to determine its potential for further development. So just to note, we, we did highlight the $8.5 million um, for the waterfront master plan. When you capture in uh, the marina component that was in there, uh, that was projected out at $4.1 million. So collectively it came in at $12.6 million. So if you do see that published in, in the media anywhere, that's why you will see that, that $12.6 million number. Um, but for the purposes of the waterfront master plan itself, excluding the marina, it sits in at 8.5 million. So the 65 recommendations uh, were organized into eight areas. The, the first area being just waterfront wide, of which there were seven of the 65 recommendations made. Robert Simpson Park had 13 recommendations. Our municipal marina also had 13. The treatment plant, fishing dock, and lookout uh, area had three. The west side gateway and lookout had three. Hydro Park had three, Bell Park had 11, and McLean Avenue Beach had 12. So having a look at the accessibility features uh, waterfront wide, four, four of them were to uh, feature pathway uh, surfacing improvements. So looking at asphalt pathways, boardwalks, you name it, um, that would kind of have that entire waterfront trail all connected to ensure it was accessible to, to the public. Pathway lighting, um, which I think also lends itself to accessibility, making sure that people can safely see the pathway that they're on and access that at, at any time of day. Uh, signage, wayfinding and interpretation strategy. So much like what we're looking to achieve here at the Nick Smith Center through wayfinding and ensuring that that signage um, is the adequate size, has braille, et cetera, ensuring that the, that signage and wayfinding uh, meets the uh, accessibility standards and also a, a seating strategy as well that would again I think mirror much like what we did with the the downtown revitalization project ensuring that um, what's included in that seating strategy meets the accessibility needs as well. So this is uh, just an image that kind of depicts the overall uh, waterfront uh, plan and the areas that are captured within it. So you can see that uh, the trail basically, or, or the network of it all kind of begins at Robert Simpson Park, going all the way along the waterfront uh, towards Madawaska Boulevard, across the bridge, uh, through Hydro Park, down Riverview Drive, into Bell Park, and then wrapping back around McLean Avenue to, to McLean Beach. And, and you can really see in an image like this just how much uh, waterfront space we actually have to to actively uh, or passively enjoy. So accessibility features at Robert Simpson Park, um, park-wide accessibility improvements, 
pedestrian ramp to beach, which is something that we've long discussed, even trying to fast track ahead of the waterfront master plan, uh, accessible washrooms, and ensuring that the playground and splash pad are accessible. And those were all captured within those recommendations for Robert Simpson Park. And this graphic uh, highlights what Robert Simpson, what the proposed uh, lookout uh, or design, I should say, is for, for Robert Simpson Park. So again, a, a network of pathways that ensures that wherever you want to go in, in the park, um, there's a, a pathway network to, to get you there in an accessible manner. So whether that's coming through the formal entrance um, at the top of the hill on John Street, coming into uh, the main park area to access the washrooms, uh, a pathway network that takes you to the existing fountain that's there, um, into the middle of the park where there's a designated play space that would feature play structures and splash pads, uh, connecting uh, towards the existing gazebo, and then towards the, towards the parking lot um, at the top of the hill is where the proposed accessible ramp uh, would be featured that would kind of wrap around down that hill, down the embankment to the base of uh, the, the waterfront, kind of meeting up where the current stairs uh, come down to, to the beach level. And also in here, you'll see that in the parking lot area down at the waterfront, it's highlighted to have accessible stalls there as well, which we also um, enhanced this summer as, as part of the work that was done down there. Uh, this is just a visual of where that accessible ramp would come out again, as I mentioned at the bottom of the, the stairs that are currently in place. Um, and it was noted in the plan that, uh, you know, this is something that will, you know, through the engineer design phase, we'll look at, is this the, is this the most appropriate and efficient design for an accessible ramp? Do you want to have something that um, kind of is such a long run that kind of goes down that sloped hill? Or do you want to go with more of a switchback model, which was included uh, in some of the, the earlier designs as part of the waterfront master plan? Again, that's something that can uh, be determined through, uh, through that engineered uh, review of, of what this ramp would look like. Uh, this graphic just highlights uh, the, the proposed plan for the marina. A variety of major changes there, um, looking at, you know, public parking and again, having a, a paved surface down there, uh, a sidewalk that would come all the way down, uh, that would connect all the way up to Albert Street, but coming down Ottawa Street into the marina and would connect with that waterfront pathway, uh, a harbor master building that is proposed there um, in, a, in a separate plan. It also looks at, you know, there could well be an option at looking at uh, have residential uh, living down there as opposed to the Harbor Master building, looking at a condo tower there, which again would require um, a lot more review in terms of the viability of a project of that nature in that specific location. Um, and part of the proposal also looked at moving the boat launch kind of into where uh, the current marina slips are located, uh, looking at changing where the, the accessible points are to each of those uh, each of those piers and ensuring that uh, right now only pier one is the only uh, accessible pier that we do have down at our marina and ensuring that all of the access points uh, to the piers and to the individual slips or a select number of those individual slips would meet the AODA guidelines. Uh, this is looking at the, the, the fishing dock, which is uh, near the treatment plant. So there's a cantilevered fishing dock. Uh, again, would be accessible right from the pathway onto this cantilevered fishing dock and also provide a, a pretty uh, spectacular vantage point of uh, a really attractive part of that waterfront uh, where the falls or the weir is, uh, if you prefer. And also kind of beautifying that area, uh, buffer planting, decorative screen across the treatment plant, uh, which was something that uh, I think the public, a lot of the, the public highlighted in, in trying to just beautify that area in terms of what people are, are seeing along that area of the waterfront. 
So this is a, a look at the West Lookout Plaza. And I think what's important about this is, uh, you know, after the, uh, the investment that the town has had in the, the downtown revitalization, I think this is the next phase in all of that is in terms of a major, major project in revitalizing our waterfront is ensuring that there is kind of like that, uh, that plaza area, if you will, that connects the downtown into this waterfront area. So again, you see in, in this image here uh, to, on the left-hand side, there's kind of a, a wayfinding area. So you can kind of see, hey, what is this waterfront about? I think which is not just benefit to our current residents, the new residents coming to our town, and of course the visitors that want to explore uh, our community. Uh, you can see how they've depicted on the, the far left of this image, uh, the, the original uh, bell from Town Hall, uh, as well as also incorporating the, um, the turbine from, uh, from the old grist mill um, that's currently in place there. So a very welcoming area that will connect people to uh, the, the river walk, if you will, um, that goes along the, the, the west side of the Madawaska connecting to uh, the Ottawa at Robert Simpson Park. This next graphic uh, highlights the design of what's been proposed at, at Hydro Park. So just in behind the, uh, the, the Quality Inn and, and, and Riverside, uh, Riverside Bar and Grill. Um, and looking at uh, adding another performance area um, and also some tiered seating. So I think this is a very uh, underutilized area of our waterfront. We, we obviously see it's, uh, uh, you know, what can happen there on, on Canada Day and stuff like that when crowds gather to watch the fireworks or previously when we've had Canada Day car shows there. Uh, there's a network of pathways to ensure that it's accessible to that, uh, that shaded performance platform and then connecting all the way through uh, Hydro Park, all the way to Riverview Drive that would allow uh, people to, to maintain access through that park, through Riverview Drive and and continuing on with, uh, with the waterfront trail. This next, this next image uh, depicts the design uh, for, for Bell Park and uh, very heavily focused on, uh, on kind of play spaces uh, and engagement for youth, which is what kind of Bell Park was, was, was deeded to the town for from the, the Bell family uh, for the youth of the community. Uh, so it includes some uh, some log themed play areas. So trying to go with that natural that natural play space area, um, which I think is would lend itself very well and nicely to that area as well. Um, and one of the neat designs is a, is a timber lookout structure that kind of provides I think a, a really nice vantage point of uh, uh, of this location where where those rivers the uh, the Madawaska and the Ottawa meet, and also providing more uh, specific parking uh, to this area because I think with a plan like this it's certainly going to draw uh, a lot of visitors and a lot of residents to this area so making sure that there's appropriate parking as opposed to kind of the I'll say the almost one lane of traffic that currently exists there and kind of the concluding uh, part of this waterfront trail if you're going from west to east it kind of concludes uh, at McLean Beach and something that we kind of, uh, I think, through uh, the first summer of, of dealing with COVID-19, uh, really saw the value of outdoor play areas. And of course, Robert Simpson Park was a very popular destination uh, with the beautiful beach and play areas that we have there. Um, so we, that summer, tried to direct more people to go down to, to McLean Beach. It was a beautiful waterfront space a lot shallow and safer water in that particular area, uh, especially great for young families uh, to, to go to. Uh, so this particular summer, we already kind of jumped ahead by adding some, some beach sand to that area, expanding the beach a little bit more, um, cleaning up that waterfront area. And that's exactly what this part of the waterfront master plan is looking to do to expand that beach, uh, having that boardwalk to, to ensure accessibility to the waterfront area, adding a shade structure, uh, sports courts, uh, specified parking. Obviously there is parking there right now, but uh, certainly trying to get that paved um, that would just kind of connect with the, the asphalt roadway that's already there. So uh, implementing this, this master plan, having a look at the financing here. So the, having a master plan in place for our empire's waterfront will certainly allow the town to take advantage 
of various project funding opportunities, uh, whether it's staff-led projects, so using the internal resources that we have, capital financing, uh, grants, which we're certainly seeing uh, a lot more of through COVID-19, where it comes to outdoor um, spaces, especially in terms of recreation, uh, public-private partnerships, development charges, private enterprise releases, and donors. So a summary of this 20-year master plan, it's an important tool for, for budgeting purposes. It should be viewed as a living document to be updated and adjusted through the annual budget, budget planning process. Uh, recommendations may be advanced, delayed, or amended to respond to changing circumstances. Some initiatives will require additional community consultation to arrive at detailed plans and design. And uh, this committee will certainly hear uh, more about those. Council and consultation with town staff will determine when and how uh, the initiatives are implemented. And I'd be happy to take any questions on uh, that plan. Anybody have any questions? It's a lot of information. I'm curious. I'm curious about the sand. Does it have to be renewed every year? Uh, at Robert Simpson Park, yes. Uh, not so much at, at, at McLean Beach. So this summer was the first year that we've put sand in at McLean Beach. And I mean, I've been going there since I was probably five or six myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was certainly worthwhile. Um, to, to, to add some sand in there, but Robert Simpson Park, most definitely since the, okay. uh, since the, um, the, the breakwater was, was removed um, every year, uh, just the current that comes down the Ottawa pushes that sand kind of around the point uh, inside the Madawaska. Um, and while creating an inviting uh, area because it is shady, it's also the most dangerous area of, of that waterfront yeah. um, where there is uh, the strong current in the undertow there. So um, part of this plan does look at having uh, a breakwater reinstated, much oh, like okay. it once was. Um, yeah. And that would prevent uh, kind of the, the erosion that we see on an annual basis. So just to give you an idea, we're typically looking at anywhere from a dozen to 20 dump truck loads of sand that have to go in there. Um, every year to to kind of reinstate uh, the the waterfront area of, of Robert Simpson Park, the beach area. Um, and I recall, you know, 2019 because of the the high waters that we had uh, that year. I think we were north of 25 or 26 dump truck loads that had to to be brought in there. So um, certainly something that uh, you know we have to do in the interim, um, but something hopefully that 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 breakwater will. Mm -hmm. Uh, will change and allow us to expand that beach further uh, west along uh, the Ottawa River and the, the face of Robert Simpson Park. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, Graham, how will uh, boardwalks and spring flooding work? Yeah, so that's something that we'll have to look at. We haven't, you know, when we looked at the, if you look at the high water point that we saw in 2019, it never reached that height um, where there was an issue, at least on the, the section of Robert Simpson Park, where a, a boardwalk was proposed. Um, we'll certainly have to be mindful of the pathways more along the Madawaska River as you kind of come around the corner to that straight stretch through to the marina. Um, so that'll be something that has to be considered in terms of, you know, what material is used there um, and does it need to be elevated when that is being put into place. Yeah, I guess the McLean Park is quite low as well. Yeah, so certainly something that we'd have to, to look at elevating there and, and something that we've, we already have in, in the budget for, for 2022 is to install a, a Moby mat at Robert Simpson Park. So that would provide accessibility across the beach sand directly into the water. And that's something that we would look at adding at McLean Beach as well. And that's something that you can um, remove at the, the conclusion of every year so that there's, there's no damage to, to that piece of, of equipment and then reinstate it um, at the time of the year when, when there's no longer a concern with, with high water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've noticed McLean Park this year was busier than I've ever seen it. So your work is, is receptive with the people. 
Yeah, it definitely was a lot busier and, um, you know, we're, we're glad it worked out because we were, we were really reaching um, uh, ca- capacity limits at, at Robert Simpson Park, not just in terms of vehicles, but just, just, just people being down there enjoying the waterfront. And um, I think a lot of people found a, a hidden gem in what we have at, at, at McLean Beach. Mm-hmm. I'm also glad to see Bell Park uh, develop because that's been terrifically underused. I couldn't agree with you more. (laughs) Hey, thank you, Graham. Thank you. We have no matters table or deferred. We have one staff report, our draft 2021 annual accessibility status report. Yes. So, um, Madam Chair, I do have a resolution to read for this one, um, if that's okay. So that the Armpire Accessibility Advisory Committee receives the draft 2021 annual accessibility status report. And further that the Armed Car Accessibility Advisory Committee recommends that council approve the 2021 annual accessibility status report. So a mover and a seconder. I'll move, Dave. Okay, and Linda, thank you. Okay. So Kayla, I think you're presenting. Yes. So I'm just gonna go over um, verbally. I did present a presentation at the last committee meeting on October 6th that went through the status um, report items that needed to be looked at. Um, So in the package, I have provided the draft status report, which will become not draft and then go to council for approval. Um, And then I'm looking for any further feedback or any further items that um, this committee may see that needed to be added or if you had any questions on any items that were in the report. So just a little background again, the 2021 Accessibility Status Report is an annual update that is required um, under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act as well as the um, the ISR (laughs) Integrated Accessibility Standards Regulation. We do have a multi-year accessibility plan Uh, We chose to um, approve, council chose to approve a five-year multi-year accessibility plan. So every year on that plan, we need to do a status report to show what status and where we're at with the plan that we've created. Um, We are going into our last year of um, status. So this will be the last real status report. And then um, coming next year, we will need to be creating a new multi-year plan um, for this committee to provide feedback and provide comment into, as well as um, attention, then council for approval. So the status report includes initiatives that we completed in 2021 as outlined in our multi-year plan and it identifies items that were previous complete, previously completed for ease of reference. So we leave everything in so that people don't think something wasn't completed or not. Um, And the purpose of the status report is to make the public aware of the town's progress um, concerning our plan and to prevent and remove barriers meeting requirements under the AODA and ISR. So to look at the accessibility achievements for 2021 that are listed on the status report, for under general initiatives, March, June, October, December, um, we now have had an Armpire Accessibility Advisory Committee meeting. We have continued training for new hires on accessible customer service, understanding human rights, integrated accessibility standards, um, information and communication, employment standards, as well as design of public spaces. And we did create a new inclusivity and diversity advisory committee, uh, which I do think this touches on that as well. We have our own accessibility committee, but inclusivity and diversity does speak to that as part of that as well. So under the employment um, notification to the public uh, that accommodations will be provided upon request um, is still there. Uh, Notification welcoming accommodations through the recruitment uh, process and employment life cycle. So every time we go out um, for recruitment and on our postings, we have that notification that accommodations are uh, provided upon request. Um, And availability of a return to work program for staff members um, through our our EARS program and accommodations where necessary is still being provided under the employment section. Information and communication, uh, that was a big a big deal this last past year for accessibility. So we do continue to use an accessible contact us form for logging complaints, inquiries, requests for service and compliments or any other kind of things like that to contact the town through our website. 
Um, it's an, a newly updated electronic complaint management system that we did um, approve that links to this form. So these concerns get linked into our system automatically. Residents are able to submit information through the town's website and receive email confirmation of their ticket submission uh, with a ticket number. We've also um, this year separated out um, the general complaint form, which does still include file enforcement, but also separated out of a new complaint form or contact form inquiry form for bylaws enforcement specifically. So when you click on contact us on the town's website, you get tiles on the screen that will allow you to go contact us, um, giving you staff um, directory information, contact us generally with your general inquiries or contact us regarding a bylaw specific um, inquiry. So the forms are the same, they look the same, they are the same um, way, but it comes to specific bylaw categories when you're on that on that form now. We also continue to look at all documents posted on the TAMS website and update um, for accessibility where required. And we are still working on this. This is a process that we're taking on internally. So the documents that are posted on our website are as accessible as staff can currently create them. Um, and we're doing our best to continue to add more documents as we go. Um, in, we have the installation of Adobe Pro software now, um, which has an accessibility checker as well as our word processing that also has accessibility checker that has been installed on multiple staff computers. Um, investigation began for additional software to create um, accessible documents with us looking at um, additional software um, that is out there to kind of help speed up this process potentially and maybe allow other staff members other than a couple people in the organization um, that are able to do that. So we also, are, we're keeping to create these documents and providing staff um, with the training on an ongoing basis. We did in, um, institute a new town website, which is WCAG 2.0 AODA compliant um, with a company called eSolutions. So our new town website is um, a AODA compliant with the new um, standards. So the new access we have as well for online payment forms and submissions, um, as well as previously those that were provided. So we do now allow people to um, submit marriage license applications online, um, which was not um, um, available before. So we've uh, created these forms that are accessible, forms that are embedded in our website where you literally fill out the form and hit submit in the form. So it's an accessible form embedded in the website. Marriage license is an example of a new one. We've now put our pet registration still, our parking tickets online as well still, and other various licenses. We are slowly moving more and more of our um, forms to the embedded format versus the PDF fillable format or PDF printable format, um, because that does make them more accessible and easier access and easier to use for members of the public in general. Design of public spaces. Um, we did receive an inclusivity um, ICG grant uh, received and it's being implemented by March of 2022. Grant did speak to that again regarding the wayfinding signage for the Nick Smith Center specifically. Um, we did also um, have a grant submission for ICIC, which is an application that was called Growing Outdoor Play in Arm Prior. The announcement for this grant is still pending from the federal and provincial governments, but this would include upgraded pathways and play structures at Caruso and Legion Park to include accessible access to parks and include some accessible features in the playgrounds to be completed in the near future. The Nick Smith Center parking lot project, which was talked about by Graham was also completed this year, um, that it provided um, more accessibility. The Canada Community Revitalization Fund grant application was submitted in 2021 for accessible ramp at Robert Simpson Park. Um, no response has yet been provided to date on this application, but we have submitted an application for that. An additional accessible parking cells were also added at Robert Simpson Park with one additional um, accessible parking cell also being added at our marina. Sidewalk patching has been completed across town and improvements at the intersection of Daniel Street and Edie Street with the curb being depressed and with the twizzy or tactile walking surface indicators that were being installed at either side of the crosswalks as well in this area. Um, tactile walking surface indicators are also have been installed on sidewalks um, during the Alicia Street construction project. 
So the next steps for accessibility is to complete the Town of Armpire's compliance report that is due this year by the province on December 31st, 2021. We'll have to do a re-audit of all town facilities and parks, um, looking at our update to this multi-year plan next year. We will need to continue to consult with the public, persons with dis disabilities, and our accessibility advisory committee on an ongoing basis. Uh, we will need to complete a full review and walk through all town facilities again with our committee, um, hopefully in the spring of 2022, kind of when winter settles down, but not right in the summer. So we'll, we'll kind of scale it for there as a step in the process for establishing the new five-year plan. So for um, the benefit of anyone that is different, I, I, Dave has been on this walkthrough before. I do think it is a great um, exercise. We take our committee members on this committee through a walkthrough of all of our facilities, our parks, and we ask, even if it has to be done over a couple of days or a couple of times, um, but we get feedback on the accessibility of all of these areas and buildings and things. So whether or not they're legislated or not, that's where that further goals above and beyond um, is in our plan. Um, and to be honest, we have added lots of those things in there on our plan. We've uh, completed quite a few of them that are not necessarily legislated items, but were able to be completed over the course of the last five years. So um, I think it's a great exercise that we'll, we will be reaching out again in the new year for that. So investigate options for additional software for creation of accessible documents. Again, we're gonna to continue to do that as a budget um, depending item. So we'll see how that goes, but we are currently into the process of investigating more options for accessible document creation. I'm incorporating our accessibility into our 2022 municipal election, uh, the clerk's office, and we will be um, undergoing our municipal election as a town next year. So we'll have to be looking at policies, procedures, and alternative voting methods for residents um, and incorporating accessibility into that election process. And continue to consult with this committee on various projects and initiatives as required under the Act. Review corporate policies and bylaws to ensure accessibility compliance. Continue to monitor our website and web content as well as update any existing web content for accessibility and continue to welcome accommodations through the recruitment selection process and employment life cycles and ensure our new facilities and any reconstruction that happens are designed with accessible features and with that design of public spaces standard in mind. So with that, I'm not gonna go through the further go goals above and beyond that were completed. I did that at the last meeting. If anybody has any specific questions for me on what we've completed, what further goals and above and beyond are there and what ones maybe have not been completed yet. And if you have any further feedback to provide, that would be greatly appreciated. Any questions or comments for Kayla? I just agree that the walkthrough of the facilities is a good idea. It's valuable. Okay. I agree. I think that sounds like a wonderful idea. Perfect. All right. I think that uh, a lot has been accomplished and next year we'll be doing a lot more and creating a lot more work for everybody. <laughs> okay, I looked through this list and, and it's, uh, it's uh, kind of overwhelming to see how much has been accomplished in such a short period of time. Thank goodness for grants as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kayla. So we have no other comments. We have no new business. Oh, Kayla, go ahead. Oh, I need, an, need all an all in favor. favor. Sorry. Yeah, yes. we need an all in favor to receive that information and and um, recommend it to council. Perfect. All in favor. Thank you. Okay. Um, so as I was saying, we have no new business. If there's no other comments, I will call for an adjournment. Not seeing any, so. <laughs> You are moving that we adjourn, Linda? I am. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll second it. David seconds it, and I will third it, so that would be a favor. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, and we'll see you again in a few months. Night, everybody. Merry Christmas. Good night. Yeah. Thank you. Merry Christmas to Thank you all you. as well. <laughs>